Um, I'm going to continue, of course, uh, talking about, um, of course, our lecture today, which is, um, of course, on the Old West. And you hopefully can see there. Uh, and, um, and, of course, Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid, that's what that picture is. Famous outlaws, of course, in the Old West um, a long time ago. Uh, the Old West usually goes from, it starts in the 1860s, um, usually after the uh, Civil War. So usually starting 1865 uh, to 1900, that's usually the dates of it. Although really by the 1890s, pretty much the Old West uh, was settled. So during that time, you know, Americans began moving westward towards like California, Oregon, uh, and then uh, a lot of people began to settle between there, which the area between there, uh, if you know about it, was later dubbed the so-called um, Great Plains region. That's often the term that they use for the so-called Great Plains. Uh, of course, men like Zebulon Pike, you know, also sometimes call it the Great American Desert because you know about the Great Plains, it's mostly a grassy area which um, doesn't have a whole lot of trees uh, and all of that. That was considered, you know, back then, that was considered the frontier area. The frontier area was like the area where um, the country was uncivilized uh, and just being developed. Um, so those areas were kind of dangerous because um, a lot of the Native Americans lived there. So quite often moving into there, if you're a farmer or settler, you might often get attacked, of course, going into there because of that. Now, before, I guess, the Old West started, like in the 1860s after the American Civil War, we did, uh, there was like a cases where uh, the United States began to explore that area of the West. Uh, this was all done under President Thomas Jefferson. You know about it. The United States bought Louisiana from France in 1803 from Napoleon. Napoleon sold it to us, Napoleon Bonaparte. It was later called the Louisiana Purchase, uh, as you know. Uh, and uh, this whole landmass here uh, was bought here between like where the United States was at the time and the Spanish territory. So the United States wanted to figure out, you know, what was out there uh, and all that. So he commissioned this expedition of uh, Meriwether and Lewis, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark to go explore Louisiana territory, find out what was to the West. Uh, they were also hoping to find some way to reach the Pacific, like maybe there's some kind of sea route uh, that would take there. And so um, Lewis and Clark with 40 men uh, left uh, in 1804. Uh, they traveled up the Missouri River here, you can see here, and then took the Missouri Yellow River where they crossed the um, Rocky Mountains, and they even eventually made it to what is Oregon, Washington area, on the west coast of the Pacific. So, um, of course, when they went this way, which we'll talk about later, uh, Lewis and Clark, you know, first encounter a lot of Native American cultures there, especially the Plains Indians uh, that are pretty much in this green area here, along with others like the Nez Perce who are up in here, Shoshone and Blackfeet as well. So they call this the cores of discovery is what they dubbed it. Lewis and Clark returned to the United States in 1806. But all this was basically considered part of the United States after 1803. So that was the initial first thing that where, you know, Americans went westward and started seeing, you know, what was to the west um, in all that. Then you had Zebulon Pike. He was another, sol he was a soldier and explorer uh, also for, um, the United States under Thomas Jefferson as well. Uh, Pike, um, his job was to kind of investigate what was in the, kind of like in that southwestern area. So you saw here, Lewis and Clark were going in the northwestern part. Well, he was, he went in this area here, see what was over that way, southwestern Louisiana in that area. And uh, he explored and he um, went up the um, Arkansas River and all that. 
into where, where the border between Louisiana and Mexico is. And he uh, went up into where Colorado is. It's about where he went into. And of course, he famously found this mountain there in Colorado, you've probably heard of, which is called Pikes Peak, which there's a picture of it over here. She tried to climb, but he never reached the top. Uh, and so it got named for him. And then from there, he turned back and uh, went back to, you know, the United States, the rest of it. So uh, Pike, like I said, is the one that coined the term Great American Desert, uh, which uh, was a term that kind of turned a lot of people off about wanting to settle the Great Plains. Uh, so that's why a lot of people wouldn't really do it until after the Civil War. And the country was kind of already kind of busy with other things anyway. So very few people settled the Great Plains. Uh, most people went westward uh, to either California, Oregon, where you had mountain men up in the Rockies, you know, trapping and um, hunting animals, you know, for fur. Uh, then you got the Great Plains Indians, of course, which are very, very famous, um, which were, of course, in that area between uh, the Mississippi River Basin on uh, the Rocky Mountains. Uh, if you know much about the Great Plains Indians, they're very famous uh, for their whole horse culture, uh, using horses uh, to hunt. They're mostly hunter-gatherers. And predominantly what they hunted the most, as you know, was buffalo or what they call American bison. Uh, that was pretty much their main resource, uh, not just food, but for making anything from clothes to their teepees, make tools and weapons out of them. Um, and um, the um, buffalo were in millions. Uh, I forget the number exactly of what it is, but there may, I forget exactly how many there were before the Civil War, but there were millions of buffalo that ranged pretty much across the whole thing maybe 8 to 10 million, maybe at the time, I think, in the 19th century. And uh, so a lot of these Great Plains uh, Indians live in that kind of shaded area uh, that you're looking at right there, all the way from like Montana and the Dakotas, um, all the way down to Texas. Uh, I may have added some slides in here, which I'll put up later. Kind of left some slides out that I wanted to put in. But um, Blackfeet, you have the Crow, Sioux, Cheyenne, Pawnee, Iowa, Arapaho, Kansas, Wichita, Kiowa, Osage, um, Comanche. Yeah, Wichita is right here as well. So all these different Native American cultures are all up and down here between, you know, the Mississippi and close to the, you know, Rockies and all that uh, that were there. So. Uh, here's another slide, of course, about them. Uh, yeah, the kind of food, that, of course, that they would make out of the buffalo, which is very famous. Of course, they would make jerky out of buffalo. I don't know if you ever eat buffalo much. Bison, it's pretty good. Uh, like my, I like to make um, bison tacos out of it. You know, you get ground beef and make tacos. I actually use buffalo or bison instead. It's pretty good. Um, but uh, they would make it to use, like, jerky out of it. Uh, Pamika, I don't know if you know what that is, but it's like a mix of like um, buffalo meat, fat, and like berries, um, and they would eat it. And um, and then uh, also the supposedly the best part to eat on the buffalo, believe it or not, was the buffalo tongue. That was the best part of it. So if, you, if you're a warrior, you got even you killed the buffalo, you had the right to cut the tongue out and you get that piece uh, for you. Uh, of course, they use the hide uh, for clothing, the teepees. Teepees uh, are called either a teepee or also called a wiki up, is what they call it as well. Of course, they, they took the fat and they make soap and oil out of it. The bones were used for different things. Horn, they'd use it to, like, the bone and horns were used for different things. Spoons, cups, tools, you know, and so on, and all that. Uh, the culture had also not just dealing with buffalo. They had religious ceremonies, like they believed in, like the, like these spirits in nature, um, the great father spirit, I think they called it. Uh, they also have various ceremonies, like I know the Sioux had the um, sun dance that they would do, uh, which you'll probably see in the video. I think the other video I'm showing, Sitting Bull's got something about the sun dance, 
it was a religious ritual that they had that was famous. Um, those were the most famous tribes. I don't know about the Dakotas much, but I know the Cheyenne Sioux were pretty big tribes. Sioux is the most famous one. Uh, Lakota Sioux and others, uh, variations of them uh, that they had. They had other animals like deer and similar kind of animals uh, on the on the plains um, overall. Yeah, here's another picture showing all the different you know parts of the buffalo and how they basically use it. So you, know, you got like your hides over here. Raw hide was used for different things. You got the horn used for different things. The brain was used for different things too. Looks like it. skull, tongue. Beard, the beard was used for different things. Hair, the hooves, they used to make glue out of it, etc. Stomach was used for different things like buckets, cups, etc. The dung was actually used for fuel. That's true about that, of course. Bone was used to make tools and weapons. Uh, you see there, of course, I'll tell you about the fat. Uh, it was used for different things like soap and oil. Tail was also used for different things. Muscle, mostly used for like jerky, you know, etc. Like their teepees, a lot of their clothes was made out of the you know the hide of the buffalo. Uh, a little bit about the culture of the Great Plains Indians. Yeah, they did have a social structure, like a government and all that. Um, you can see that a lot of them were broken down into large nations, which they still are today, like the Sioux, Arapaho, Cheyenne, uh, and so on. Then from there, they're divided down into tribes. Um, and they have sub-tribes, uh, Ogallala Sioux, uh, Teton Sioux, Siston Sioux, um, and so on, Lakota Sioux. And so these are all, you know, sub-tribes of the, the actual Sioux nation, as they called it. And sometimes the tribes can be broken down into various smaller bands, uh, which might have a few hundred people uh, in it. And of course, each of these tribes are all, you know, led by some kind of chieftain, like a chief uh, that leads them, usually a wise man or someone who became very powerful uh, and strong with as a leader among the group. Uh, there are like council meetings where they would, you know, sit around and discuss things that were important to the tribe. Uh, in fact, each man was man anyway, no women uh, were, of course, entitled to speak, you know, whatever they thought was important. Uh, at the meeting, but in the end, the 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 chief, whoever the chief was of the tribe, he had the last word on what they would do on a certain decision. So anyway, just kind of talking about the background of the of the Plains Indians and their culture goes back to you know I think when the um, first conquistadors explored you know the the New World, they were kind of already developing at that point on the plains, because I think it's, uh, who is it, uh, Coronado, I think, who first came into contact with some of these tribes, like the Wichita type tribes, I know, that were like around Kansas, Oklahoma uh, area. So they've been around for a few hundred years, but um, the, the conflicts that we'll talk about next, which of course occur, um, is because of conflicts between the U.S. government, of course, and the uh, Indians. And of course, one of the big conflicts, as you know, that occurs uh, is the destruction of the Indian culture, which you know was caused by one main thing, or two main things, really, um, at least early on, was the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. That was one of the main things uh, that really led to it. Uh, and then the destruction of the Buffalo. So a combination of both those things really uh, played kind of a role uh, in it, uh, and um, the government had different policies about the Indians. Uh, you know, if you know about the American government, at first what they did was they forced the Indians to move westward, like west of the Mississippi River, like to Oklahoma uh, and other areas. Uh, and then the next thing they did was they started taking their land uh, and they started forcing them onto reservations. And of course, some of the Indians didn't want to live on reservations because they were traditionally hunters, uh, like hunting buffalo, uh, et cetera. So that set the stage for the conflict, you know, between both sides. And so when they were building the Transcontinental Railroad, you know, what happened, uh, the Americans, you know, they were building it, 
started killing off all the buffalo, not only to feed the workers that built the railroad, uh, but to destroy the, you know, the uh, Indian culture of the Plains Indians. And of course, Buffalo Bill, you've probably heard of him, William F. Cody, he got his kind of fame started out as a cowboy and Indian fighter, uh, and of course, hunting buffalo, which I think Cody may have killed more buffalo than any man, which was like over 10,000, which is a lot of people. I mean, a lot, a lot of, um, a lot of buffalo. Uh, and um, anyway, um, so that, that's definitely the, the main thing. And then, of course, the other thing I told you about was the development of the railroads. Of course, that had a lot to do with the killing off of the buffalo. And uh, you can see, oh, there, that might be the number, like maybe 1,800. They may have had 15 million. I don't know if that's the exact number of how many it was, but it was definitely like 10 million or more that they probably had uh, in Buffalo uh, in the West. Uh, and you can see by 1886, it was down to only a few thousand uh, that was basically left. Uh, so they killed all the buffalo. Uh, and so that was one of the main things uh, that really led to um, why the Indian culture declined. It was also a way to force the uh, Indians uh, to live on reservations. Uh, like we get rid of all their animals that they have to you know, kill and live on. Uh, then they'll have to live on government reservations and all that. And so that was, I guess, another reason why they did that as well. Uh, they have made a comeback, you know, the American bison or buffalo. Uh, we get the number now today, but it's probably in the thousands. And, of course, a lot of people raise them out in the West, um, which um, people eat eat buffalo meat now today. You can also eat steaks, which aren't bad. Um, also as well. Now, because of the destruction of the buffalo, one of the things that happened, of course, was the Indian Wars broke out, which broke out in the 1860s. Although really, truthfully, the American government had been fighting the Native Americans going back to really the founding of this country. Uh, you know, uh, But these are the so-called Indian Wars that, that occurred after the Civil War uh, they mostly lasted, you can see there, for about 25 years from 1865 uh, to about 1890. And um, one of the first um, conflicts they talk about that broke out was what they call Red Clouds War, 1865 to 1867. Uh, this, of course, is a very famous Sioux chief you may have heard of, whose name was Chief Red Cloud. And he lived up in the northern part of um United States where like South Dakota in like the Dakotas and uh, Montana area. And um, anyway, what happened was in Montana, there was gold discovered a place called Bozeman. It was called Bozeman, Montana, in the 1860s. So a lot of settlers started pushing westward to go to Montana to find gold speculators. And so that led to the building of what they call the Bozeman Trail, which was a trails, trail that ran through um, kind of like the Dakotas and it went through Montana. It's also part of the Oregon Trail that, that kind of branched off that went westward. And uh, so all these people started doing that. And of course, the American government started building like these U.S. forts up and down the trail as well. And there was an American soldier named William J. Fetterman uh, who believed that he could ride through the Sioux Nation with a small force. And uh, this took place in um, 1866, December 1866. It was called the F Fetterman, Ma Fetterman Massacre or the Fetterman Fight. I think December, the, I think it was 16th, maybe the date. But it, it, the Indians called it the Battle of 100 Slain. And Fetterman's whole force was massacred and it caused Red Cloud's war to break out. So it provoked Red Cloud, and you can see that Crazy Horse, who we'll talk about later, Crazy Horse was a, um, was a famous uh, Indian warrior uh, that was under Red Cloud, also later under Sitting Bull, and he kind of participated in the war. He was like really young at the time. And uh, in the war, the uh, Plains Indians, the Sioux won. They won the battle. 
And uh, what happened out of the battle was the U.S. was forced to sign a treaty with them called Fort Laramie, Fort Laramie Treaty Year 1868. And what the treaty did was it gave uh, con uh, control of like Western South Dakota, what they call the Black Hills, Black Hills of South Dakota, was given to the Sioux, Sioux Nation. So they, part, they still control part of it today. And, um, and if you know what happened later, the United States found out later that was a bad idea. They thought they were just giving them some like a bad area that wasn't really worth you know settling. And I'll talk about later what ends up happening, of course. They end up finding gold there, like in the Black Hills of South Dakota, and that that would that's what caused uh, more conflicts to uh, eventually break out. Uh, and so that led to another thing, which is uh, they had what they call the um, Battle of Little Bighorn. And um, the Battle of Little Bighorn was part of a, a war uh, in 1876-77 uh, that was called the Great Sioux War. I think that's usually what they dub it uh, overall. And what happened was the Sioux decided that they didn't want to live on their reservation and they left to go hunting, like in the plains, like upper plains, basically. And so uh, the Seventh Cavalry was sent uh, to basically stop them, to, to get them back on their reservation, uh, basically. And um, they were led by, of course, George Armstrong Custard, uh, who was an American soldier. Uh, he was a Civil War veteran. Uh, actually, it graduated last in his class at West Point, which is true. Uh, and if you know about Custard, he was a very flamboyant uh, type of officer. It's kind of like a ladies' man. Uh, and uh, the Sioux called him different names. They called him Yellow Hair because so he had long, blondish hair. Sometimes maybe long hair as well. And then... um. Sometimes they also called him the uh, son of the morning, son of the morning star. Yeah, you know, son, son of the morning star, uh, because of the fact that um, he was known for attacking dawn. And uh, you'll see in that documentary later on Custer that um, he was famous for the Battle of Washita in 1868, uh, where he defeated the Southern Cheyenne. And of course, one of his tactics that Custer was known for. Uh, to try to subdue the Indians was that he, he tried to take hostages, uh, mostly fem uh, women and children, like of, of Indians. And that method actually worked. Uh, and that was one way that the American government forced the Indians back on the reservations uh, by basically seizing the women and children and killing the men, like massacring all the men off, uh, which they did. I think the Battle of Washita took place on November 27th, 1868. That's where he fought against the um, Southern Cheyenne chief named Black Kettle, who I think was killed in the battle. It's really his best Indian victory, uh, the Battle of Washita. But Custer was known for committing atrocities, which has kind of, you know, uh, made him controversial and all that. Uh, of course, you know, uh, you see, of course, in that video later uh, that you're going to watch that on that video, that documentary, BBC documentary, of course, on the Battle of Little Bighorn. Custer's forces, of course, eventually are going to fight a combination of Lakota Sioux, uh, Northern Cheyenne, and also the Arapaho. Those are all the different Native American groups that, of course, Custer fought against uh, in what is southern Montana. Uh, the actual battle took place over a two-day period, June 25th to uh, June 26, 1876, really in this, uh, what is the eastern Montana part, southeastern part. And it took place around a river called the Little Bighorn River. Uh, the uh, Native Americans called it also the Greasy Grass River. So it's the different names of the actual battle. And then, as you know today, they call it Custer's Last Stand. That's the that's the famous name uh, that they call it now, Custer's Last Stand, which has kind of been romanticized. And uh, as you know, they've made a lot of movies about it, uh, where Custer's kind of romanticized as this guy that fights the death. Uh, of course, in some movies, he's kind of seen as being deranged and crazy uh, and stuff like that as well. 
Uh, here's a painting of it. You can see J.K. Ralston. So yeah, there's kind of a, there's a lot of paintings of it that's, that have been, of course, depicted uh, that have also shown what happened. Uh, but now who did he fight against? Uh, yeah, mostly it was the Sioux, but the Cheyenne also put up forces. And um, most of the, the um, Native American forces were led by Sitting Bull, who's a famous medicine man and uh, Indian chief. And then one of his greatest warriors who was at the battle was Crazy Horse. He was well known, died in 1877. And uh, of course, in that battle, part of why they won was that they heavily outnumbered, you know, uh, Custer's whole force, like three, four to one. Um, and back Custer in the battle itself was, he was almost outnumbered like eight, 10 to one. It was pretty bad. Uh, and um, eventually Custer, uh, got surrounded, as you know, uh, and his force was wiped out. Uh, like all the men under him and under his personal command uh, were all killed uh, in the battle. And with the rest of his force that also got killed and wounded uh, and all that, about 268 were actually killed total uh, out of the actual force. So Custer's last stand, you know, about a little bighorn, uh, was considered one of the worst defeats uh, in American history, but a lot of people think that in the end, it was kind of a downfall uh, for the Native American culture, like of the Plains Indians. And of course, it angered a lot of the Americans, you know, about this. And so the Americans put more money, poor men uh, into trying to subdue them, and they would within, take them a few years, but by 1890, most of the Plains Indians were forced back on the reservations is what happened. There's a picture of Sitting Bull on the bottom, of course, there you see right here. Uh, Sitting Bull, of course, I don't know if you know much about this, but he was later in Buffalo Bill's famous Wild West show. I mean, if you know that, and, and um, you can get a picture with him and stuff like that. And um, he um, would help, uh, be helped uh, Buffalo Bill kind of reenact the battle even though if you know about it, Sitting Bull wasn't there. Wasn't actually at the battle. I think Crazy Horse was. Um, but um, he was later arrested in 1890 and was killed. Uh, this is like, I'll get to it later, but this happened uh, with the whole um, Wounded Knee Massacre uh, that happened in that year. Um. And that's the other thing I need to talk about that also happened, too, uh, of course. They, of course, have the Battle of Wounded Knee, as they dub it, uh, which is um, often uh, a nickname that they call, um, really, it's called the Wounded Knee Massacre. That's what a lot of the Lakota Sioux call it today. And uh, what happened was um, 1890, by that time, most of the Native Americans of the Sioux were forced back on the reservation. And uh, however, there was this movement that was real popular that was called the ghost dance that took off. Yeah, the ghost dance. And it was this um, religious ceremony that was real popular with the Native American culture, especially with the Sioux. And uh, they believed that they did this dance that their dead ancestors would return and the buffalo would come back. I think they talk about the white buffalo, which was like a sacred buffalo uh, that would return. They believed that this would eventually lead to all of the, the white settlers, the U.S. government disappearing and would perish. And then they would add their lands back uh, and all that. So the U.S. government was kind of getting scared about this. They thought that war was going to break out uh, again between the Sioux uh, and, and, and the government again. Uh, and so um, a lot of them were led by Sitting Bull, of course, uh, who was still one of their top you know, Indian chiefs. And um, in December of 1890, uh, what happened was uh, the 7th Cavalry uh, came to deal with it. And it led to an incident where apparently they were trying to disarm um, some of the Sioux uh, at some of the reservations. Uh, there was one that was called uh, Wounded Knee Creek. It's called, or where, that's where it was, in South Dakota. And apparently um, there was a, I think what happened was there was a, some kind of misfire or some kind of, somebody actually fired the rifle 
the Seventh Cavalry opened up on them with rifles, and I think there was even a case where they started using like Gatlin guns, which are like machine guns. It was under Colonel James Forsyth was in command, and they massacred something like 300 Lakota Sioux. Uh, not just men, but women and children were killed, and they were uh, eventually buried in like a mass grave. So um, it was considered one of the last armed conflicts in the Indian Wars, uh, and but it's of course left kind of a bad stain on things. Uh, between the Native Americans and the U.S. government. Uh, and truthfully, the American government uh, had a policy uh, which they didn't really trust the Indian. And uh, their whole view of the Indian was that the Indian was a savage uh, and that they were better off dead, you know. So um, so anyway, that's, that's you know, the peak of the Indian Wars uh, and all that. Uh, and we'll talk later how, you know, they're going to try to Americanize the Indians and, and try to make reforms uh, to that. But it's still kind of a problem today uh, between the U.S. government and the Native American cultures. You know, they've never really solved the differences, I think, uh, even though they've tried. Now, of course, starting in the 19th century, like 1870s, 80s and 90s, you know, and all that, they did try to Americanize. Uh, the Native Americans. That's something, you know, they did. Um, I was talking about that whole image of the Indian. It was kind of tough, you know, because people still saw the Indians as savages, you know, uncivilized and all that. And uh, when people think of that term, uh, they think of like what Philip Sheridan said. I don't even heard that term about Phil, Philip Sheridan, but Sheridan was the one they think that coined that, that so-called saying that the only good Indian is a dead Indian. Of course, this saying has been used for all kinds of people. Uh, you know that. Uh, and um, so the U.S. government, starting in the late 19th century, tried to Amer uh, Americanize uh, the Indians. Uh, I think their whole point about the Indians uh, was that they were going to try to um, turn them into farmers. That's what they wanted to do, uh, even though most um, Native Americans traditionally were like hunters, hunter-gatherers. Uh, they didn't really farm that much. If they did, it was a small amount. And um, you can see also, so they did that. They forced they forced them to try to farm. It's one thing they did. Uh, they tried to abolish their tribes. Of course, they brought them back later, you know, Sioux Nations or whatever. They tried to, to ban, you know, their tribes, get rid of them, disband them, uh, and stuff like that. And um, all this was done under the Bureau of Indian Affairs, uh, you know, which is part of the Department of Interior uh, with the U.S. government, which was founded in uh, 1839. And uh, but a lot of cases with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, they had a lot of corrupt officials who wouldn't, you know, supply them like they should. Uh, there were a lot of speculated like white settlers that would come in and steal their land uh, and all of this. And uh, so that had a lot to do with part of the reasons why. Um, Things didn't work out with the whole Americanization of civilization uh, early on. Um, now, um, oh, here's a picture showing you too on the bottom here. But they even had schools. I'll talk about this uh, a little bit uh, brief. I'll come back to that in a second. But they even had schools uh, where they tried to assimilate uh, Indians as an example. There's one here on the bottom called the Carlisle Indian School. I've never heard of it but it's in Pennsylvania. It was found in the 1870s to try to Americanize uh, Indians. And uh, so here's a picture of when they first came. And then later on, after they've been Americanized, you can see uh, they made them cut their hair. Uh, they made them adopt Christianity uh, and stuff like that. Uh, they trained them in like different industries, you know, how to farm and whatever. So they're basically trying to make them into good Americans, you know, that kind of thing was what they were trying to do. Um, I didn't want to talk about Helen Hunt Jackson a little bit, about her, about who she was. Um, Helen Hunt Jackson was a famous writer uh, in the late 1800s, and uh, she was considered one of the first writers, uh, author, to uncover a lot of the injustices of the U.S. government and about how they were treating people, treating the Indian uh, Indians in the West 
And um, her book was called A Century of Dishonor. It was published in 1881 and described how uh, the American policies had been to you know, destroy the Indian culture, wipe them out, uh, force them onto reservations. Uh, they continuously broke a lot of treaties uh, with the Indians. And um, this book led to various Indian reforms uh, throughout the country. And uh, the big things it, it led to, of course, the most was the whole Dawes and Burke, Burke Acts, which came out 1887 and 1906. Uh, and so she was kind of influential in, you know, leading to that eventually happening. happening. But I wouldn't say it was exactly, you know, um, something that fixed everything. Uh, it was just like the first instance where someone spoke out about what was going on with the U.S. government um, treating the Native American culture uh, and all that. Uh, you can see here uh, in this, um, well, they got that slide. So, yeah, part of the whole thing of the Dawes Act, like I said, was to try and Americanize, simulate, um, you know, Native American culture, uh, encourage them to kind of be more like, you know, the rest of Americans, white Americans uh, as a whole. And, uh, you know, they had killed off all their buffalo, so it's not like they're going to be able to go and try to, you know, be hunters anymore anyway. So I guess they really had no choice, uh, more or less. Um, and uh, so the Dawes Act of 1887, what it basically did was it authorized the United States government to basically survey all the tribal lands and allot them land. Uh, kind of like the Homestead Act, basically. So under the uh, Dawes Act, the uh, Indians uh, could get land uh, basically to settle, uh, which was about, I believe it was about 160 acres of reservation land uh, can be claimed by Indian family, uh, basically. And uh, this land would be held in trust for 25 years. Um, so because I think they had to stay on the land for 25 years, and then they would become citizens um, of the United States. Uh, of course, the Burke Act, I believe, looks like it postponed it a few years, uh, but uh, that was the point of what the Dawes Act was about, uh, which was enacted in February of 1887, you can see, by Henry L. Dawes of Massachusetts. So so that's basically what the what the... Uh, Dawes Act was, and the Burke Act was kind of like an ex modified version of the Dawes Act, um, which was supposed to lift or reduce the 25-year trust period. But um, by and by, it was, um, yeah, it was somewhat successful, um, you know, giving, you know, allotting land uh, to the Native Americans. But if you know much about it, a lot of the land they gave them was terrible. It was like horrible land. That you really couldn't farm, and that was one of the problems uh, that they had. Uh, so uh, the mistreatment of the Indians, you know, uh, would continue. Uh, and um, I think under Franklin D. Roosevelt, there was some kind of um, revamping of the policies and all that. But it would it would take years for, for some of these policies to kind of you know evolve over time. So anyway, that's just, you know, the, the whole thing about the Native Americans and, and what happened with the Indian Wars and the Americanization, or at least attempts of the Americanization uh, after, after, after the wars, of course, occurred. All right, I got time for maybe one more thing I can talk about. Let me kind of just for a few minutes and talk about also the other thing, of course, that happened in the Old West. That was the rise of the cowboy. I don't know if you know much about the cowboy and all that, but in the late uh, 1800s, after the Civil War, you had like what they call the cowboy that became real popular uh, in the, uh, that starting in the 1860s and all that. And what caused the um, importance of the cowboy to develop in uh, late 19th century American history was because of the importance of the cattle industry uh, that developed in Texas, Midwest, and also in the East because people wanted beef, you know, steaks or whatever to eat. Uh, and so, uh, however, the only problem was all the cattle, if you know about it, was in Texas, you know, Texas way down there. Uh, there was no way to get it. You know, there was no railroads that went down to Texas. 
Uh, and so the only way they could get the um, uh, cattle to the north, like into the Midwest where, you know, the, the railroads were, was for cowboys to herd, you know, all these cattle northward, like on what they call a long drive. Long drive was like a, a stretch where cowboys would uh, push herds of cattle uh, from the southern Great Plains, from Texas, all the way up to like, you know, Oklahoma, Kansas, where they would put them on trains. And then from there, they would take them to um, places where they could, you know, butcher the butcher all the, you know, cattle and all that. And um, anyway, the cowboy, I don't know if you know much about the cowboy. The cowboy was something started by the um, Mexicans. I think I've got a picture uh, showing that about that. But the original cowboys were actually Mexican. They were called a vaquero. Vaquero uh, in, in Mexico uh, and Texas. Uh, the first cowboys you know, helped train other people uh, to become to be cowboys. Like a lot of cowboys in the whole West were Mexican, uh, if you know about it. A lot of cowboys were also African-American. Most people don't know that either. Uh, maybe out a fourth of them. Uh, there's a lot of African-Americans that left the South and they went West. Uh, they became cowboys. Uh, so that's something that a lot of people don't understand about that uh, as a whole. Most people, you know, see these whole Hollywood movies and all the cowboys are white and it's not really true. Uh, they're kind of a mix of white, black, Mexican, Hispanic, you know, uh, basically. Um, of course, there's that, that old Wild West myth, you know, about cowboys that you see like in dime novels and in Hollywood movies uh, that came out later. And so people think of, you know, Buffalo Bill, Wild Cody, you know, that's Annie Oakley, you know, that kind of stuff. They think of Butch Casting, Sundance Kid, the James Gang, Billy the Kid, you know, all those kind of things. Uh, those kind of like you think of stuff like that, dime novels, you know, talked about. But uh, reality of being a cowboy, by the way, um, was actually not that glamorous. It was actually very dangerous, very lonely uh, type job. Um, not too many women around, <laughs> that kind of thing. Can be boring, actually. Hard work, very hard work, often in the saddle all the time. Um, so the stereotype of, of, you know, buffaloes is kind of like exaggerated and it's not like Hollywood, you know, ass and all that. Um, now, uh, yeah, like I was talking about the long drives uh, and all that, uh, what happened with the long drives uh, is that they eventually developed cattle trails, you know, about this, uh, to herd cattle northward. And uh, you can see there are actually four main cattle trails that eventually developed for the long drives, where they would herd these cattle northward from Texas. Uh, the earliest trail uh, that was first founded was one called the Chisholm Trail. Uh, which you can see there from where, where it started in San Antonio. Then it went north towards Kansas. It was founded uh, in 1867 by Jesse Ch Chisholm. Ch yeah, Jesse Chisholm, J-E-S-S-E. -S -S -E. And um, that was the first one. Uh, the other one that was famous uh, was called the uh, Shawnee Trail. It was called that because it went through Shawnee Territory where Indians were. And it went towards Missouri, Sedalia, Missouri, right here. Uh, another one was the Goodnight Lovin' Trail. It's kind of a funny name. It was founded by these two men named Goodnight and Loving, Charles Goodnight and Oliver Loving. They founded that trail. Then they had one more trail, which was called the Western Trail. So all these trails went to different areas, like Goodnight Loving Trail went up to Cheyenne, Wyoming. And then this one here, Western Trail, went up to uh, Ogallala. And you can see the Chisholm Trail went up to like Abilene, Kansas, Ellsworth, Dodge City, which you may have heard of as well. So all these different trails uh, went northward. Um, and, of course, there's like railroads running through, you know, Missouri, Kansas, Colorado, Wyoming, Nebraska, uh, where they can, you know, put them on trains to take them to the east, like Chicago, I think was the St. Louis, Chicago. Those are big areas. They'd take them to where they had slaughterhouses. They would slaughter cattle uh, and stuff like that as a whole. 
Now, by the 1890s, though, the whole cowboy thing started to decline. Uh, and um, there's different causes of why the whole long drive started going down. You can see the peak of the cattle trail was from the 1860s to the 1880s. And um, what happened was the open range ended. I don't know if you know about this, um, but they started you know, enclosing all the land. Um, I don't know if you heard of Joseph Glidden, who he was. Joseph Glidden, G-L-I-D-D-E-N, Glidden. And Joseph Glidden was the man that invented, bar he invented barbed wire. So they started, you know, enclosing all the land, barbed wire, and whatever else they could, fences-wise. So that that helped to basically cause the end of the, the long drive and the cattle trails. Um, also, by the end of the 19th century, they started building railroads uh, into Texas. And that was another reason uh, for it. Also, they say it was also severe winters, droughts may have contributed also to why they couldn't do the long drives because they would drive into certain areas with the cattle and there would be no grass to feed on or maybe water to drink. And so that kind of became a problem of uh, them trying to move cattle around uh, and stuff like that. Uh, and so uh, the decline of the long drive uh, ended uh, after that. Uh, and um, and so one of the things that happened after that, if you know about it, was that then cattle ranching developed in Texas. Cattle ranching. And so people started building ranches uh, to raise cattle there because you had railroads where you could just you know ship cattle uh, to market. And so in Texas, um, you know, uh, they were just probably hundreds and thousands of these cattle ranches that were everywhere. The average cattle ranch could be anywhere from 2,000 to 100,000 acres in size. Really huge. So yeah, there were still cowboys, but those of them worked in either Texas or Mexico, or maybe New Mexico even as well. Uh, and so that was the advent of the peak of the cowboy uh, and all that. But the culture of the cowboy is still around. You go to Texas or other places, you'll so people see, see people wearing cowboy boots and cowboy hats and it'd be like urban cowboy, you know, drive around a pickup truck <laughs> like that. But that's kind of like the leftover, you know, thing from the whole cowboy age and in, in the late 19th century. So uh, anyway, um, I think that's it for lecture wise today uh, overall. Uh, and um, before we go, uh, just a few reminders uh, before, um, uh, I guess, on Thursday, next class coming up. Don't forget, like I said, uh, about that announcement that I've got posted uh, on uh, Canvas. I've got two new lectures that have been put up uh, that are real important, um, which, of course, I told you is the Canvas quiz um, on the video on the um, little Battle of Little Bighorn. Uh, so-called Custer's Last Stand. So make sure you um, finish get get that done within a week. That's going to be due on September the 15th, uh, which is a Tuesday. Uh, and then the other one is the um, Canvas Quiz number one, uh, number two, yeah, number two, on the Gilded Age Lecture. That's the one that's on the, um, that one's on the corruption and politics of the eight late 1800s, you know, dealing with like Grant's corruption under his administration and all the different elections that happened there, James Garfield assassination. I think I talked about all that stuff. So that's the bulk of, um, I think, most of the stuff uh, that I had. And then don't forget that Canvas quiz on Reconstruction is still open. I'm going to leave it open for a couple days more, I think till Thursday, if you haven't finished it. So try to get that done. You don't want to get behind because, uh, you know, the semester is going to keep going, you know, overall. So if anybody has any questions um, about this lecture, let me know. Um, you know, send me questions, uh, comments uh, about the lecture. Because uh, remember, uh, you do get bonus fo points for that. Uh, for sending me, uh, you know, comments, questions about the lecture. I think I, I usually give three bonus points for, you know, any kind of historical question you ask. 
you know, I don't care if it's kind of a stupid question. Just send me whatever question you could think of. Uh, any kind of comments about the lecture uh, is fine. You usually get two bonus points for that uh, as well. So just to remind you about that. Uh, that's you do that through YouTube. So you go to the you know where the lecture is, the video, and you'll just add a comment in. Okay. So I don't know if anybody else had any questions out here right now. Um, but anyway, I will see y'all on Thursday. Uh, on Thursday, what I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be uh, finishing up the Old West. Uh, I'm going to talk about kind of like the uh, how I'm going to talk about like farming in the West, like how it developed and all that, what they did uh, as a whole. And then we'll talk about the last frontier, how like the last states like Arizona and New Mexico were developed. And then uh, after that, I will be getting into talking about uh, the the rise of the uh, industrial age, the United States, like rise of big business, uh, captains of industry. We'll get into that. That's our next thing on um, Thursday's class. So I will see y'all later. Y'all have a good day and uh, take care. Hopefully y'all had a good Labor Day and all that. So I'll see y'all on Thursday.